I'm about to conduct an interview with a man who made football boots for God. And I'm not joking. Uh, my name is Tech, and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm recording on, uh, the Wajik people of Nungabuja. And I'm very pleased today to have with me Jess Wooden uh, of uh, Wooden Cordwainer. And uh, uh, Jess is just setting up there, I think. <laughs> G'day, Jess. How are you going? <laughs> Good, thank you. Nice to meet you. And uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah. That's terrific. Terrific. Um, I guess we should be Australian <laughs> and talk about the weather. It looks like it's a bit cold for you over there, is it? Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's always it's cold in the workshop. Uh, yeah. we, we're, in, we're in the south corner of the workshop of the building here, and uh, it, um, it's it's actually a nice. It'll be a nice day today, but it takes a while for the place to warm up. Yeah, I, I actually um, like about ten years ago, we had friends living in Lexton, so oh, yeah. when we were in Melbourne, we used to go through Ballarat quite a bit, and you know, or they meet us in Ballarat and have lunch. So it's a really lovely place in the country. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. It's a pretty amazing historic, you know, it's, and it hasn't been really um, changed all that much, you know. In, in, uh, the old buildings are still there and it's pretty yeah. intact. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And it's also the uh, filming place for Miss Fisher, I think. Bryony Fisher. Is yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, right. they film in that. Ballarat, apparently. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. And, um, <laughs> yeah, because of, because of the old buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, this whole, I mean, this whole region, there's a lot of little towns around that are... Um, you know, they're really, they're really historical. So, yeah. you know, it's a big tourist, tourist attraction for sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, a lot of my viewers are actually American, like a substantial part are from uh, US, uh, South America and Canada, uh, and, yeah, right. and not very many from Australia. So for the benefit of our American viewers, before yep. we get into your brand, tell us a bit about yourself, you know, your personal and family background. Yeah, so... Uh, well, my, my dad started the business. Um, he was, uh, you know, started learning shoemaking um, and he started as a leather craftsman, but um, really fully fledged shoemaking in the early, mid-1970s. Um, undertook a, uh, a traineeship with Pietro Salome, who was a, the, he took over the um, training facility at the, at the jam factory in Adelaide, which is the capital city of South Australia. And, um, and dad, mum and dad moved um, to South Australia for that purpose. So, that was that was 1976, 1977, somewhere in there. Um, and then we've moved around the we've moved around the country for you know various places. I've been in New South Wales, Melbourne, and now we're finally in Ballarat. Um, and so the business has been running sort of for 50 odd years or so. And I, I've been um, in charge of it for uh, 17. And um, before that, I um, studied industrial design and worked at General Motors Holden, um, so the Australian. Oh you know, version of, of GM, um, designing car interiors and things like that. So I had a real job for a moment, but um, it didn't really, <laughs> didn't, really, didn't really sit well all that well with me. So <laughs> here we are, I'm making shoes. <laughs> what were you doing with Holden? Was it in the design end? Yeah, so they've, they've, got, they've got a design and engineering department at, in Fisherman's Bend, or they had, in South Melbourne. Um, and uh, yeah, I was working in the design department, designing, working on like advanced materials and show cars and that sort of thing. We did a couple for uh, a couple of international show cars for um, Chevrolet, uh, which was yeah, it was it was, a, it was interesting. It was an interesting insight, you know, into a giant corporation. But um, right. so how 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 did you? I mean, obviously with your dad's background, you you were a la around leather. How did you find yeah. the move from from fairly industrial uh, 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 work to into uh, working with your hands on leather? Well, oh, well, I've always worked. With my hands, I've always made stuff. You know, Dad, um, you know, literally, I literally grew up in Dad's workshop. So when we were up in northern New South Wales, when they moved from Adelaide, um, mm -hmm. they built the workshop before they built the house, and right. we ne he never actually built the house. <laughs> so <laughs> we literally lived in the workshop, and um, and then uh, you know, so I've always been around makers. You know, so Dad, Dad was uh, a shoemaker, you know, by by training and profession, but he also, you know, he built our house. Um, mum and mum and him built built, our, built our, the house we lived in. Um, and, you know, and my auntie's a ceramicist and mum was doing, um, you know, uh, textiles and things like that. So it's, well, I've sort of always been around it and uh, I've always made things, you know, so renovated my bedroom when I was 14, um, you know, and 
and uh, have been building stuff ever since, basically. So we, we've just finished building our own house uh, two yeah. years ago. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I've always worked with my hands. And I think that was the thing that really didn't work for me working in the big corporation was that it was entirely hands off and there was just so much waste. You know, there was a lot of people that were doing really good work and it just ended up going nowhere. You know, there was, a, it was yeah, it was, there was just too many levels of, uh, of management, I think, you know, and, yeah. and not enough hands on, um, on hands on work. And so I guess it's good to have done that. It's good to have had that experience yeah. to know definitely that it's not the thing that I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I came back to the family business and, and so I, yeah, the, the thing, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a convoluted, story, I guess, as far as um, how this, you know, where we are now uh, differs from where dad was. So dad was a, a traditionally trained shoemaker making shoes. So Pietro Salome, um ran, so he's Calabrian, he was Calabrian. He ran a, the workshop that was basically one of the primary manufacturers for Gucci right. um, back in the seventies. And then he was given the, he was given the job to run the training facility in Adelaide. Right. Um, and so it was, you know, it was traditional hand welted, very right. you know, Florentine kind of leather work, um, right. so very traditionally trained. And and then um, I guess what I realised, and so and Dad worked by himself, you know, he had his own yeah. workshop and was just making bespoke shoes, and they're insanely labour intensive, you know, as as hand welted shoes are. Uh, and so what we what I wanted to do, I suppose, when I entered the uh, the industry was to try and make, you know, high quality things that were more accessible to people. You know, hand welted right. shoes are. 40, 50, 60, 70 hour kind of situation and therefore they're pretty expensive. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we've, we've tried to, I guess, bring the traditional, some of the traditional techniques and some of the manufacturing techniques together to make something a bit more, you know, accessible to the average person. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, for some of the non-Australians, they're probably not aware that you've appeared on TV. Uh, you're, you've had a couple of articles about you because you're a bit of a Renaissance man. You uh, <laughs> built your own house, as you say. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you're into organic gardening, um, yeah. you know, so you're, you're sort of balanced. It's not all about work, is it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, I, it, um, yeah, no, it's not. It, 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 it's, it's a, I guess we're, what we try and, it, we're, we're sort of purpose driven, I guess, that make, if that makes any sense. And, and so work and life are all kind of one and the same thing often. And, and I, I mean, I'm, fi I'm finding myself, it's funny to talk about this at the moment, but I'm finding myself working far too much at the moment because um, work's uh, insanely busy. Uh, because of the things you've talked about, you know, because we, we're getting coverage and and some yeah. recognition for what we're doing, and unfortunately in Australia the industry basically has disappeared, and so yeah. consequently, you know, finding people that are skilled in in making footwear, and, I, and you know, this is not a not entirely unique to Australia, but um, you know, we, we, we've just not had an industry for at least twenty years, and it's probably yeah. been more like forty or fifty, really, and 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 especially in welted footwear yeah. um and handmade welted footwear at that you know it's sort of that it's it's a it's an incredibly labor intensive training process and so yeah bringing people on board has been really difficult um yeah. but yeah like like i say i we we i guess you know if you were if you're looking at it through a normal lens as far as um work-life balance is concerned you'd probably consider that i work seven days a week uh. um but <laughs> But work and life are the same thing. So you know whether it be building a house or, yeah. or building or building a boot or you know <laughs> gardening, whatever it might be, they're they're all kind of driven by the same purpose. So you know we want to. So make... so I'm I'm interested um, because you are very balanced. What how do you see success in life? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I um <laughs> yeah. Well, we're definitely not we're not we're definitely not driven by the normal you know success metric which is money giant, <laughs> giant bank balance yeah we're not we're, we're not that way focused but my my purpose i think is to 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 leave the world better than it was when i got here basically that's what we want to try and do and i mean that sounds pretty airy fairy doesn't it um but well, it's a, well, it's a guess, good it's a good goal yeah ex well i think you know in in the time in, in the time that i've been running the business that i'm running um the industry's completely died off, basically. And, it, you know, there was a few medium scale manufacturers still operating when I took over the business, you know, sort of in the last 20 years. And in Australia, it's just disappeared completely. You know, there's only one, there's really only one manufacturer left, and that's RM Williams. And, yeah. and then there's just a giant gap. And then there's a few, a few small makers, you know, like people, yeah. like individuals in their garages or sheds or, you know, creative studios, whatever. And there's no one in between. And so, I guess that's 
where we want to try, where we're trying to make a difference. We're trying to, uh, I guess, be a little bit bigger than just me, and um, yeah. and also, you know, bring a quality product uh, to people that, you know, like at, like I say, at an, at an affordable price. Um, they're still not, you know, they're still not inexpensive, but they're they're not. They're certainly not what they could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the handmade nature obviously drives the price, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. It's just yeah. it's just time, you know. And and when we were, like, I often say we were reflecting on this when we were building our house, you know, that the few tradespeople that we did employ, and there weren't that many of them, but you know, they cut, they turn up to to work with a a toolbox, and they'd have you know half a dozen tools in it, and a and a power tool that you'd get from any old hardware store, and that and they were getting. You know, they were charging us 150 bucks an hour to do the work that they were doing, and I, yeah. you know, if we were charging 150 bucks an hour to make the boots, they'd be very expensive boots. So yeah. it's, you know, and we've got a where we've got a 400 square meter warehouse full of machines that you can't buy anymore. So it's um, <laughs> you know, it's a it's a it's a peculiar way to try and make a living, but it's uh, you know, I think we're yeah we're making a difference. It's it's great so, that we're you know that we're yeah. growing as we are. Yeah, yeah, I have noticed that. So it, it's a good segue to talk about the brand. So. Um, you took over from your dad. Was it called Woodens at the time? No, so it's a, yeah, this is the convoluted story. So um, it, it, in one way or another, the, it's two businesses basically that it have come together. So, so dad, um, like I say, was a traditional trained shoemaker. He was he worked by himself, um, you know, and I was in the workshop with him um, as a very small human. Um, and then uh, you know he passed away when I was pretty young. So he passed away when I was about seven and a half. And at that time. Um, so that was 91, 92, 91. Um, and then the, the, the other business that we've, we've merged with, I guess, you know, that I bought um, started in 1990. So there's this kind of weird crossover, but they, were, they, weren't, they weren't related. So basically, um, it's, yeah, the, the two guys that started the business that I bought, Custom Fit Australia, um, were from a mass, like a big, large scale manufacturing background. Um, and then, you know, we, we sort of brought dad's tools and, and tr traditional techniques towards, you know, together with what they're doing. So dad, dad was, his name was Ross Wooten and he, yeah, it was, so it was Wooten. And then the other part of the business is Custom Fit Australia, which is still the company name. Um, and they, yeah, that's it. Like, so it's, like I say, it's from a, a manufacturing background. So the, the, we've, we've had a really weird, very varied, um, you know, history, I guess. So. So, you know, you look at the P&W brands, Whites and, and Nicks and so on, and they've been making the same style of boots basically for the last, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years, whatever it's been. Yeah. Wyberg have been, you know, operating for a very long time. Um, whereas, you know, the business that we operate has been through multiple iterations um, in, the, in the 50 years of its existence. So whether it be, you know, bespoke footwear like Dad was making or when Custom Fit started they were making sporting footwear so they started making golf shoes and oh, football boots okay. and right. things like that so we, you know in the 90s we were making footy boots for all the afl or they were vfl players at the time so you know yeah. gary Ablett senior and steve silvani and those sorts of guys under oh, amazing. For, yeah under yeah. license for adidas so we had a you know we were putting the adidas stripes on the side of the boots and it was um you know so it's like you know that's obviously very different to what we're doing now um, <laughs> were they and, were they bespoke footy boot, boots for them were they yeah they were with added our stripes good. on them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so there's a few you know there's a few photos of gary ablett standing on someone's shoulders and they're you know in boots that we the make boots. so yeah yeah <laughs> it's amazing yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah i'm so guessing a, you know, your dad would have made dress shoes whereas you you're into boots is that right well, there's a bit of a, he was making all sorts. Yeah. So he's right. doing all, like he was, he, he did a lot of training, um, you know, orthopedic footwear as well. And um, so basically any shoe that you want, like, you know, it's basically whatever you want, come in and he'll make it for you, you know. Um, so I've got, I mean, there's a pair here, that's a pair of boots, um, you know, that dad made 40 years ago. Um, ah, right. So that, right. you know, so he's, he was making something similar to what we're making now. Yeah. Um, because well, I mean, you you have a new line in those sort of Western cowboy boots now recently. Yeah, yeah, we've just made some samples. I'll grab that one. It's right behind yeah. um, So that's the that's the new version of the same boot, basically. So right. it's a bit shorter, and we've made the you know the soles a bit chunkier and so on. It's sort of an updated right. version, I guess. Um, yeah, so we're we're working on, um, you know, a, 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 not the cowboy boot version. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. More of a low pass. So we're we're, kind of, we're working on some things like that. We haven't we haven't released them yet. We've got samples, um, but yeah. we need to make stock. 
you know, people have had a try on and things. So it's a, yeah. we're always adding stuff. Yeah. Um, when I first but, noticed, um, when I first noticed you, really, um, yeah. I, I had a look and I was about to go to Melbourne, uh, and but unfortunately I got COVID, so I never went. But oh, no, you no. had um, uh, variations of the Gordon boot, I think. Yep. yep. Right. And and a Chelsea boot, and that was sort of basically what you were centering yourself around. But your your selections really grown quite a bit, haven't they? You want to talk us talk us through that? Yeah. So well, when I so when I first started the business, when I first took over the business, we were making a hundred percent more or less um, bespoke orthopedic footwear. So it was you know, seventeen years ago, and then I mean that that is just an incra- crazy crazy way of trying to make a living, very labour intensive, and and you know you don't end up with a particularly nice looking product in the end. Um, and so, you know, as a designer, it wasn't all that fulfilling. And so what we've, what we've tried to do, you know, it's taken us a long time. It's a very slow moving ship, this thing we're, we're, that we're doing. Um, yeah. You know, probably, it's probably been the last 10 years, really, that we've, that we've really focused on what, you've ta- what you're talking about. So, um, yeah, the, like that's the, that's the Chelsea boot there, mm-hmm. the, you know, classic Australian Chelsea boot and the Gordons. Mm. And they've come, they've come about basically through necessity you know so mm. um you know we moved from melbourne into to gordon so that's what the, that's where the boot name comes from and right. gordon's a very cold and wet place and i needed boots so i made some for myself and um and i, I think it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing that australians have this love affair with the with the chelsea boot especially and we have we we didn't make we didn't make a chelsea boot a whole cut chelsea boot for a really long time um, because there was a, a bunch of people doing it well locally, you know, RM obviously, and then there was Rossi yeah. and um, and various other brands doing something very similar locally. And um, you know, in the 20 years that I've been running the thing, that seems to have fallen away in a pretty dramatic manner. And so, you know, there's been a lot of disquiet, I guess, from or, you know, dissatisfaction from um, long-standing RM Williams customers. <laughs> um, and so we've I guess we've just, you know, we've responded to that, those requests. I mean, you can only say no to people, you know, yeah. a number of times before you give in. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we found, and we found that they, 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 it's been a really interesting one with the, the, the Chelsea Brit, especially it's sort of, it's been the only time we've never, like we, we've had something introduced in Australia that we haven't had to really kind of educate people about, I guess, you know, they just know yeah. what they, what to expect, you know, whereas with the, like I guess you know, talking to a, a North American market, that yep. that's the kind of the North American, yeah, um, RM Williams version. You now, like like every every P and W brand makes a boot that looks a bit like that. Yeah, you know, that's a seven I Derby kind of boot. And so, um, I guess you know, you know, with that with the Derby boot, most Australians think Doc Martens. I guess is kind of their experience with that style, with that style. Um, although that's changing hugely. So there's there's yep. you know through platforms like yourself and stitch down and um you know other various other podcasts um yeah. you know there's people getting us exposed to the the north american yeah. um you know aesthetic i guess yeah uh so yeah those those two styles the chelsea boot and the and the um and the the gordon boot are the are the two i guess they're kind of our bread and butter if that makes sense yeah. and then but we have introduced yeah we're introducing the the pull-on boots hopefully next year and we've got a, 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 a um a ca- more casual version, which is probably, I guess more like um, it's more my more more my aesthetic, I suppose. So that's a that's that's oh, the nice yeah, the Smith, that's the Smith work boot. So it's rounder. It's a bit yeah. more like a grown-up version of Blundstone, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so nice. Somewhere, somewhere between a Blundstone and a and a um, and an RM. And then yeah. um, recently we we did. We went back to our Adidas days and started making sneakers. Right. <laughs> so, so they're um yeah. So I mean, this oh. is you know obviously a play on on that history. Um, and so that, that like that one's a it's un, it's unlined and it's kangaroo, um, but it's got a you know it's got a leather wedge, so it's pretty unu- pretty unusual looking thing, I suppose. Right. Um, but they've they've been really surprisingly popular, for, you know, for Terrific. for a business that operates in in Ballarat, you know. Terrific. So, yeah, yeah, it's been it's good. So, it's really um, do you do you design your own lasts? Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. So, uh, that's been a big part of uh, the transition, I guess. You know, from being bespoke uh, shoemakers, where we're making orthopedic footwear on you know plaster casts and very particularly odd-looking foot shape things. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and orthotics and 
you know, and and uh, knee braces and you know, like you know, KFOs and all sorts of different things. So it's been it, like that. That that's obviously got its own set of uh, challenges, you know. But um, in in bringing on a, a on a line uh, that we've designed ourselves, you know, all of the upper patterns and so on, um, we needed to develop a set of lasts as well that would suit um, you know what we're trying to do. And so the lasts that we use are based on a most you know mostly they're based on a, a 1940s dress shoe last uh, so it's yep. an historic um anatomically kind of asymmetric yep. last uh, and we've you know just varied heel heights and toe shapes and things like that to um to suit what we're what we're making yeah so it, yeah. It, 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 and we do have a, we've got a really pretty we've got a pretty broad variety so we've got um what have we got one two three four five i think we've got seven or eight yep. standard last ranges um, and then based in like different shapes and then and then different width fittings uh, of those as well. So it's right. and, we're, and we've, we've we've been adding uh, we've added a few in, the, in yeah. the last in the last year. Like you say, you know, we, um, a couple of years ago, the the Jack gusset boot yep. and the um and the Gordon with yep. the, the two kind of yep. you know. Step, but like but step even then, the the Gordon came in different lasts. You could you could order different lasts in the Gordon, couldn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we make that we make that style of that that, that, that upper um, yeah. on four different toe shapes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So what's your? I mean, that's that's in the last year there's been an explosion of different models. So what's what's been your yeah. design process? Is it people asking you for a different model? Is it you going? Oh, I've got to be in my bonnet. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, a bit of both. Yeah, a bit of both. Um, we had a so the the sneaker <laughs> the sneaker came about because we were. Um, we had a, a graphic designer working in our space. He was working upstairs, right. um, and he's he's a great guy. Um, and he he wore Adidas to work uh, often, and they were junk. <laughs> 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 and I just kept saying to him, Trav, you know, we, I've got to do something about this." And he was like, "Sure, let's do it." Um, and so the aim of the game was to make a repairable sneaker, um, yeah. you know, because because. I mean, you buy, you know, you buy a pair of Adidas or Tigers or whatever, something of that ilk. And the, like, he was, you know, lucky to get six months out of them. Oh, and yeah. Then, you, right. you buy them knowing you're throwing them away, don't you? Yeah, that's right. And, and it just, I mean, surely there's got to be a better way than that. Um, and so that was the that was the aim of the game, I guess, with those. Um, and, I, you know, I was really surprised. We I made this this one, which is, so it's got, you know, it's got a Dr. Soulful soul. Right. And, and it's got a welt, right? So, and it's a ste- right, it's right. Heel, so it's step. So it's basically like a hybrid sneaker boot situation, yeah. you know, sneaker boot, dress shoe situation. Yeah. And I, I made this sample just more or less as a talking point. So when people, because people, I mean, people pick, pick, pick this one up and they go, oh, gee, it's heavy because, it, you know, they're used to a sneaker weight weighing nothing. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't really compute. And I thought, yeah. well, if I put a, if I put a welted sole on there, then, then yeah. it'll hopefully. It's different. Know, yeah. People will be like, whoa, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> I know, so I didn't I didn't really expect to sell any of them, and it's probably we've probably it's probably been about fifty fifty. It's this, yeah, cause we sell about as many of these as we do of any of the other. Oh wow! Sol, a... Soul tops, and so like I've been really surprised by people's willingness to take on something that is completely out of the you know the norm. Um, yeah. For them, yeah, it's been really kind of refreshing actually. Yeah. 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 So so, so the design the design process is a bit of like. I, I mean, I get a bit. I get any time I'm designing something new, it's because I've got to be in my bonnet about something. But it either comes from somebody saying, you know, oh, I reckon we should do. Oh, well, how can we? How about we do this? Or it, or it comes from frustration. Yeah. yeah not being <laughs> able to get what what you want really. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You you mentioned the 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 welt around that sneaker. So you you use something called a Mackay stitch. Yeah. Um, which I think is Blake Rapid. Is that right? Yeah, they're yeah they're interchangeable, I suppose. So yeah. Blake yeah. and McKay, both it's the same thing. So Blake yeah. originally developed the machine, and then McKay bought the patent and refined it. Right. Uh, so like early Blake machines are often chain stitch, um, which is a completely different stitch, a lock stitch, obviously. Um, so we use it's a it's a lock stitch McKay. Um, right. the, the machine still referred to as a Blake machine. Anyway, right. they, they, it's one of these. It's like gemming and gemming and. Right. You know, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're talking to. Um, but yeah, so it's it's basically instead of having a a, a welt, we have yeah. a, a midsole which is mechanically fastened to the insole on the upper. Um, so the upside to the McKay stitch as as opposed to a, a Goodyear um, is that there's there's no fabric involved. It's just all it's all leather and it's all mechanically fastened together. So um, 
I've got some I've got some boots that I've cut in half that we talk to customers about. That right. With. So that's ours. Um, yep. So you can see that that row of stitching. I don't know if you can see yep. that, that row of stitching on the insole there. Yep. That goes yep. through to a midsole. Yep. And then the and then you have your welt stitch that runs around the outside, which is right. You know, okay. Um, traditionally, like, you know, normal welt stitch, and that's the, so that's the midsole there. Right. Without the outsole attached. Right. Um, so you know, which is different. That's so that's you know, that's a traditional hand welt. So that that's the difference. Yep. You know, so you can see the welt like that's a normal welt, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, and then you know, the upside to that versus the Goodyear situation is that's that's an old RM that we cut in half, and there's nothing actually holding the insole. Yeah. To the Aside from a bit of glue, so yeah. over time that does break down. It doesn't really matter how well you make it, you know. Eventually, yeah. that, that it will. That the layers separate. Yeah. 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 So I mean, yeah. The upside to it is that it's all locked together. Yeah. Um, the downside to it is that it's a bit slower. You know. Is it, is it also lighter because you you're missing a layer? No, it's heavier. It's so heavier. Common, okay. Yeah. So that's a common misconception. So because Blake and Blake Rapid share the first word, um, and, and it's the same process, you know, so the Blake, the Blake stitching process is often used as the sole attachment process, so the outsole is attached with that Blake stitch. Yeah. Um, that can be lighter. Um, I mean, it's, it's it basically the only weight difference is that thin strip of welting, so, yeah. it, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it'll be a few grams lighter than a than a, yeah. a good, your welted shoe, assuming you're using exactly the same materials. Sure. Um, but the Blake Rapid, that's the one I guess downside. If it, if it is a downside, is that it is a heavier construction yeah. because so that um, yeah, being a midsole, you know, yeah. you've got all of this extra material here. Sure. Uh, as opposed to a, a welt, there's yeah. there's no material there. That's just yeah. normally filled with with cork yeah. or, or or leather. You know, yeah. they're traditionally made. So, is that a um, sorry, bring bring that bring that Chelsea boot back? Is there a little pad of cork in the middle there on the on the foot? Oh, in here, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so we we so yeah, there's, that's a bit of um, a contentious one sometimes for people too. So, with with a midsole, if this we call that a donut, yep. just because it's like a you know, it's a hole. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because we cut this hole in the middle of the insole. That that'll give you a bit more cushioning, obviously, with the cork. But it, it it's basically about flexibility. So what we want to create is that's you know that's acting like a welt, right? Rather than a full midsole. And so the, diff, the, right. the the issue with a full midsole is if you go, say, you know, for example, this, it's held to break in. Yeah, exactly. This Gordon boot, you've got like we use a so we use a five mil veg tan insole, and then you've got like three mil of leather or so three or four mil by the time you've got upper and lining and toe puff and so forth together. And then you've got a three mil in midsole yep. and then you've got a five mil out, out no, yep. second midsole and then you've got a five or six mil piece of rubber, you know. Yeah, you've got, you've got a, a bit of a centimetre, yeah. Yeah, well, you've got, like, it ends up being something like 25 mil thick, the boot. Yeah. And if that's just solid leather, then you're just not going to bend it, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and we and we used and we used to yeah we did that originally when we started using this construction method without the without the you know the donut, and we just find we just found people couldn't wear them in you know yeah. and 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 you hear this you know with people talking about P and W boots often it's like you know if you if you're not bleeding then you're not doing it right you know it's like, well, <laughs> really <Yeah. laughs> do you need it's to a, <laughs> it's a badge of honour <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I mean sh sure. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to go down that path, do it. But uh, you know, we 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 had a pair of boots come back. I had I put it on Instagram the other day, and there was a I met a guy at the we do a thing called the Lost Trades Fair, which is a a fair of people doing weird old things that no one does anymore. And um, you know, we ha you have to demonstrate them in front of the public basically. And and so this guy came past our stall and was like, oh, you know, I, I have trouble with but with which boots. I wear them out. I, you know, I can't get shoes that last more than six months. I was like, oh, I'm sure I can make you a pair of boots that last you more than six months. Anyway, so I really sold them last week, and he'd, he's worn them every day for six years. And um, and the the midsole was in perfect condition. So I, I you know pulled the outsole off, the midsole stitching, like that that inseam was totally intact. And and so it's a very easily resolvable construction because when you pull the outsole off, 
yeah. you've got a you've got an intact boot still. Whereas yep. on a on a good year, you pull the outsole off and the whole thing falls apart, yep. and you have to yep. stick the gemming to the insole, and you have to hand, yep. you know, eventually have to replace re-weld the it. cork. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's yeah. a it's a shit show. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so from a you know from a durability perspective, uh, the McKay stitch is way better. Yep. Um, and I mean, I guess you know, arguably similar to a, a hand welt in so much as everything yeah, mechanically yeah. fast together. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's a bit heavier, but yeah. it also it doesn't take, you know, 20 hours to put a sole on. Yeah. Um, I think the donut is, a, it's a brilliant idea, just to add that flexibility, a little bit of little bit of squish. Yeah. Do you have a shank? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah and that, I mean, that, that's the other thing with, with this construction. So we have a steel shank in here. Yeah. Um, but then you've also got, because of this midsole, and that's being that being solid, you've you've got that kind of torsional stability as well. Right. And so like through the midfoot. So all yep. of this is quite quite structured. And then you've got the kind of you know the flexibility yep. where you flexibility. need the flexibility. You know. And yep. um yeah, I mean it, it's just it, it's a fun, it's a strange one because so there's there a company in a, in in Melbourne called Ian Harold Boot Company. They've yep. you know since moved to um their production to Vietnam. Yeah. But you know they they'd been they they started in the UK and then they moved to Australia you know in the late 1800s I think maybe in 1880 yeah. or 1890 something like that and you know they were in operation for 150 years or whatever anyway they 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 used a very similar construction method right. and made a boot that looked very similar to an RM Williams boot <laughs> um, in fact you know the story goes that they made the first boots for RM um, <laughs> because RM wasn't a bootmaker right he was a he was a, a leather cast maker. maker yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I don't 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 uh, necessarily quote me on that one. Um, <laughs> that's been lost to time. Um, that story, but um, they, you know, basically because of that, the construction method they used, and they're not they're not being quite as good at marketing as as RM. Hardly anyone knows about them. Yeah. Although this, you know, they're still operating. Yeah. Um, but I think you know the Goodyear the Goodyear method because it's been so widely um, adopted. Uh, you know, it, it, it has become kind of the, you know the gold standard of production uh, yeah. welted shoes, and you know, it's just through marketing, you know. And yeah. and the reason why it's used is that, is that it's quicker than McKay, you know. Yeah. And so you know, for a company like RM who are making two or three thousand pairs a day, yeah, yeah. If it's gonna if it's gonna cost if it's gonna take ten minutes longer to or half an hour longer to make a pair of McKay welted boots and costs an extra five or ten dollars in raw materials, then yeah. that adds up. To a yeah, lot it's, it's also very money. factory yeah. line, very factory line friendly. The uh, the um the good year. The, the good year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and and I mean, and that's the I guess that's the the difference for them as opposed to us is so much in so much as it's a it's factory line friendly, but it is entirely rigid in so much as you, you have to make all your shoes that way, otherwise yeah. you can't put your soles on. Whereas yeah. with the McKay welted construction, we can do. We can do Blake stitch construction, you know, we can do various other constructions using yep. the machines that we've got rather than it just being like every single shoe has to have a welt attached to it, yep. otherwise it won't be it won't be stitched. So yep. for a you know, for a small scale production facility, it makes a lot more sense to have yep. that flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things when I visited your website was um the options blew my mind. <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't just this boot, order it. It was like how do you want it to come? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that must yeah. make it pretty difficult to to make, though, right? Yeah. Well, so yes, it is. Um, we're getting better at, at managing that. Uh, it, you know, we've got systems in place where things don't go totally off, you know, course. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, look, the, with the with the Gordon boot especially, um, the, the Chelsea boot, there's less kind of options because it's just one piece of leather, and that you know, like you might choose the stitching color and the soling type. But you know, with the Gordon boot, you know, you've got eyelets and laces and midsoles and you know, outsoles and various, you know, like you know, different panels and all sorts of different things. Um, there's like I stopped doing the maths because it freaked me out. But you know, <laughs> it, it's like five or six billion com- when I did the math. There's five or six billion possible combinations of that boot. <laughs> And then, and then we added a few different options. So there's probably more like a hundred billion different options. You know, like it just it, it exponentially gets out of control. So yeah, we like we are we are making um, the website's the yeah kind of the limited version of what we do in store as well. Um, and we so and we do like I guess you know the way the easiest way to describe it basically is that we're making bespoke shoes without taking out a tape measure. Yeah. Um, 
so there's the, you know to a degree you know so there's there's limited we're making everything to order yeah. um, we're making it to your specifications you choose within the you know 10 billion possible combinations <laughs> which seems like enough probably <laughs> and then and then we do we are doing slight alterations in store as well so if people come in and they say oh well you know we, we make split sizes so you can you can order a split size on online right but if you come into store and you try on say the nine um, and it feels a bit tight, the nine and a half feels better width wise, but too, is too long. Then we can make the nine and a half width, width on the right. you know nine length, that kind of thing. Right. Well, you know, we, we, I made a pair the other day, just yesterday, I picked them up and he was a 10 length and a 12, 12 width, you know? So yeah. we do alterations like that. And we do, we do alterations even to, we can do alterations even to uppers and, and things right. as well to accommodate people. Yeah, yeah, coming from an orthopedic background, you know, that's kind of yeah. where our expertise yeah. has been. And and I think that's something that we've we've struggled letting go of in so much yeah. as um, you know, like you go onto any of these other, you know, boot brands that are you know, world world uh, renowned, yeah. and it's like you can have this style in black, brown or brown or some other brown. Yeah. You know, and three and, widths, oh, and that's maybe, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and maybe we'll do, yeah, exactly. And maybe we'll do some sort of special release of some other random leather that we got from a tannery one time. Um, uh, and if it fits you, it fits you, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. And if you don't bleed when you're wearing it in, then you're doing it wrong. And whereas <laughs> we're we're kind of more we're, we're really concerned about making the fit right and uh, and you know getting so so I guess we we we're, we're going the other way. We've we've gone we've come from an incredibly uh, labor intensive very specialized very bespoke background and we're, and we're slowly getting less and less bespoke yeah. But, yeah. you know so you've caught us in the kind of you know we're in we're in, we're in transition <laughs> yeah. so how because you're expanding your lines and you're still yeah. sort of having that that bespoke mentality really yeah, yeah, um, yeah how are you finding production like like i'm i'm not surprised you're working seven days a week you know <laughs> yeah yeah no well it's it's pretty um I, i'm not i'm not in the workshop seven days a week I'm, not, I'm only here five which is nice um i should be here are you are you here. getting apprentices and that sort of thing yeah we we um so we're a small team at the moment there's my wife and i chris and um grace is doing three days a week and leanne's doing sort of three half days a week we've had a bit of a torrid time um, over the last 12 to 18 months with um, with Leanne's health and so forth. So that's been, you know, difficult on a, on a, on a close-knit team as well. You know, it sort of brings everyone, means everyone's kind of, you know, having to, um, I guess, you know, look out adapt. for each other and so on. Yeah. And adapt, yeah, for sure. And, um, but we, and we have got a new um, a new guy starting next week, actually. Um, he'll be full-time, which will be good. And he's coming from a, a shoe repair background, so has has worked as a shoe repairer for probably about 10 years. His dad was a shoe repairer as well, so he's been around it for a long time. Yeah. Um, so the idea is there to, you know, get him to do some more bottoming work because um, it's, you know, similar skill set, I guess, to shoe repair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, look uh, growth and doing that well is very difficult. So yeah. 10, 12 years ago, um, I had, I think I had eight staff and it was just chaos, you know, it was just, yeah. it was just, because because you, you you know finding people um, finding people that know exactly what to how to do their job um, straight off the bat is very difficult obviously and yeah. so there's you know, training involved and I probably wasn't in a position where I could train people as well as I needed to uh, because I was too busy trying to get the work done and you know like just all that small those small business all those small business tensions I guess and so what what we chose to do when we moved to Ballarat was kind of you know bring it back in a bit focus more on the the craft of the thing and. You know, decrease our overheads, and uh, and I guess this is you know what what, what we what, what we're seeing now, I guess, is the is the fruits of that labour, I suppose. So we've we've kind of we've probably spent the last you know seven or eight years dialing in on where we want to be, and and yeah. we're getting to that point now, you know, and that's so and, sort of and you don't think ex you don't you don't think expanding your lines is putting a rod to your back? <laughs> it definitely is, but I get I get I get a bit I get a bit sick of doing the same thing every day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we haven't even talked about making leather goods. So, we, you know, we've got a whole line of leather goods as well, which is about 50% of our business. So That's right. I was going to ask you about that because it's not just boots. You're doing a whole lot of leather goods as well. Yeah. So we do yeah. bags and belts and aprons. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah. uh, we've just done a whole bunch of um, things for hospitality, you know, coasters and that sort right. of stuff. So, right. so the idea with that, when we brought that on, is that footwear is an incredibly complicated product. Right. 
very labor intensive and very very time consuming to make. Uh, leather goods probably get a slightly higher raw material cost associated with them because you know big pieces of leather and you know a whole like an overnight bag or a duffel bag or something like that's got a fair bit of leather involved in it, hardware and so forth. But it's a repeatable thing and it's something that you can teach somebody. And it, so so what it is is well how I guess how we see it is it's a you know. Uh, it's a it's the gateway drug to our brand, if that makes any, if, you know, without sounding too crass about it. Um, but also, it's a it's a way of, of bringing people on bo on board, training wise. So lower stakes. So you know, if you're talking about a pair of shoes taking sort of ten or fifteen hours a pair, you know, in in time in in your hands as they go through the workshop, and they've gone through four or five different you know departments for want of a better word with people being involved in it. Mm. You, know, you get to the end of that process with this guy starting next week who's doing the bottoming and you know you sand the side you scuff the side of the shoe mm. and then it goes you know and then it's 10 hours down the drain mm. and it's a whole <laughs> bunch of other people other people's work you know to get back yeah. to that. um whereas with a bag you know it goes together much more quickly and it's something that yeah. somebody can do by themselves so if you if you stuff yeah. it up then it's kind of on you to fix it you know yeah. um so it's a, it's a, there's a bit there's a bit less resistance there from a um a scalability perspective you know yeah yeah yeah, and I, I guess people know leather goods, and not a lot of people know boots, do they? Really? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And 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 they're not like, oh my god, shoes. You know, they've got to fit, they've got to be comfortable, they've got to work. You know, like, so so the, like the, the geographical limitation of that is huge. You know, especially if you're concerned yeah. about the fitting. Like, it's not just like I'll oh, you know suck it up. Yeah. You know, they'll, so they'll um, <laughs> you close you've closed your Richmond store in Melbourne, and you're focused yep. into Ballarat now. What, yep. What's your what's your um, I guess typical customer journey? Is it all is it mainly by by the website or do people drop in and get measured? What 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 happens? Yeah, it's um it's surprisingly I think since COVID and that was probably COVID was probably the the gave us the confidence that we needed in order to to make the, the full the full exit from Melbourne. So right. when we first moved up to Ballarat, so Ballarat's a, you know, for anyone that doesn't know where Ballarat is, Ballarat's about an hour and fifteen, hour and twenty minutes from Melbourne, uh, west of Melbourne. It's a you know, and, and Melbourne's a what a six million people yep. population situ situation. Ballarat's got about one hundred twenty thousand people, right. so it's a small, it's a, it's a big small town, or it's a a small city, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's, it, it is pretty accessible, you know, there's a train that takes about an hour and 10 or something like that to Ballarat from Melbourne Central. And so um, I was I was surprised at people's reluctance to come here before COVID. And then it just, there was just like, boom, overnight, it changed. You know, people were, people are looking for excuses to get out of the city now. And so what we're finding, we, you know, we had, we had both stores. We had, we had a, a, the store in Melbourne and we had the store out here in, in Ballarat. And we'd have people come... Uh, to Ballarat, you know, the, oh, where are you from? How would you find about, out about us? That sort of thing in that conversation. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I live in Fitzroy and uh, I'm I'm here getting measured. I mean, we're like, you know, we've got a shop in Richmond, which is, you know, a kilometre yep. from Fitzroy. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, we knew that. But, you know, we thought we, we, it's nicer to come for a country drive. And we were like, oh, OK, that's weird. That's a completely different, <laughs> you know, mindset to what it was two years ago. Um, yeah. So that that's that has changed so you know people's willingness to to get in the car or get on the train and and get out of the city that and 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 you know not to mention the fact that you know a large portion of melbourne's population moved out of melbourne um during yeah. COVID because of the lockdown mm -hmm. um so that that's that that obviously in store is one part of the journey we um the store is pretty unique uh in so much as it's attached to the workshop and there's no sort of filter between the workshop and the shop um mm. Uh, so when you walk in here, you, you, you know, you get to meet the people that are making the things, you get to see the machines that are being used, you know, you get to see the smells and all that sort of stuff. But the amount of times people walk in here and go, oh, gee, it smell. Oh, amazing. You know, like I, if you could bottle that, I can't smell it because <laughs> I'm here too much. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's that kind of connection thing, which is pretty, which is pretty powerful. Um, but, but I guess the website is we are selling, we're finding we're selling more online than we were prior to moving out of Melbourne as well. Um, but it's the website's really as a as a an introduction piece really to people, you know. So if you if you, you know, if you watch this YouTube clip, and then you look you want to find out more about us, then you then you'll go on our Instagram or our website. And so the website it's it's kind of like, you know, 
it's the triage. It's the it's the it's the it's the entre, it's the entree, whatever it might be. You know, like it's like the reception to the business, if that makes sense. So it's sort of, and it's super dense. I, I you might have noticed that there's a lot of yeah. information on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, um, you know, we're all about educating and and, yeah. and bringing but, people into but the world. For someone who can't access Ballarat, like overseas. Mm. Um, I guess they contact you on the website. How do they get their measurements to you? I mean, what, what's the process? Yeah, so I guess so that, that, that it is always an ongoing issue um, because, you know, shoes need to fit. So we do we do a fair bit now via correspondence with people sending measurements in and we can give them recommendations based on those measurements, um, whether they, you know, whether they will or won't fit or whether they're too far away from the norm for us to, you know, take that risk. Yeah. Um, we also have introduced a range of what we call originals, which are the two um, of the two styles that we that we mostly are known for, I guess, and that's the Gordon and the Jack Cusset boots. Right. Um, and so the, 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 it's one style. It's like a normal shoe, yeah. it's, you know, like it's like a, what you might expect from another brand. Um, it's it's one <laughs> style of shoe made one way in one color, and you just buy it. And you can <laughs> return it if you need to. So does it make that, you bleed though? Yeah, no, well, yeah, we should. I, I, I did accidentally leave a nail in there one time and that might have made the person believe. Um, but no, <laughs> ideally not. Um, but that, so that's the style. Uh, in, yeah. in that, in that, in that, so that's a locally tanned crust leather from Oztown is in Geelong. Yeah. Um, and so basically the idea with this boot was one, we had people come into the store and they wanted to walk out with something. Right. So you do that. We've got these in stock, and then the other, the other is that you know, obviously, if we if we offer the Gordon boot made to order service like we do, uh, and it's exchangeable, then we could we've got to have ten billion boots in comp in stock, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not going to make ten billion boots in my life. Um, and um, you know, and there's too many there's too many combinations. So so basically, trying to minimise um, minimise. Uh, the, the choices, I suppose, and so therefore we can offer something that you can then, you know, you can buy it, yep. you can ship it to you, you can try it, and then yep. you can you can exchange it for a different size if you need to. So that's yep. one one way. The other the other way um, is that, which is new to us, is is we've got some we've we've got some shoes in a store in Melbourne as a you know basically a collaboration okay. wholesale sort of situation. Um, so they're, they're they're fitting stock in there, which we then make to order, and and the show the, show, the shop's called Pickings and Parry. You're on Gertrude Street in Fitzroy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know I've, I've known Chris for a long time, um, and you know they were kind of the first workwear people to set up a workwear store in in you know like a yeah um, traditional workwear store, not a not a like a um, you know hard yakka work workwear store um, in Melbourne. And so um, yeah, they've got a, they've got a range of our Gordon boots in there for the people to try on, and then we make them to order from those. So. That's part of our, I guess, a part of our strategy of, of moving right. out of Melbourne ourselves and sort of, you know, um, setting up in in Ballarat is that it gives us the opportunity to then explore those those, you know, that way of operating. You know, we've never we've right. never done wholesale um, right. boots before because the margins right. aren't. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be. Yeah. 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 Um, so you mentioned a tannery in Geelong. Is that where you get most of your leather from? Yeah, so the the ethos, I guess, for us is to try and use as much locally sourced material as we possibly can. Um, and so, the tannery is in Geelong. Yeah. Yep. So that the cows, you know, it's mostly bovine. Um, it's, um, you know, beef cattle, beef cattle, which is, um, you know, grown in Australia. And then um, the, the, the 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 supply chain is a strange one. So anyway, the the normally. Uh, cow hides from the southern part of Australia and then their, their wet blue facilities in the middle of New South Wales. Um, oh, really? It's called Geelong Tannery, but it's not in Geelong, which is confusing as hell because the tan <laughs> the re-tannery tannery is in Geelong, in Geelong and right. it's called Los Tannery. Anyway, so <laughs> basically, yeah, and, and they've got really re remarkable, as you would imagine, being operating in Australia, they've got remarkable um, environmental credentials. So yeah. as far as waste water, water management and that sort of thing is concerned. Um, so yeah, well, they, they're doing. A, we've worked with them probably for the last two years or so, developing um, some upper leathers. We're working on a few waxy, uh, waxier versions, a bit more like currently, you know, like more like Chrome XL, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but they're all, you know, they're all full grain, um, yeah. dyed, you know, aniline dyed um, yeah. crust leathers. Um, 
and they've, they're combination tan. So they're, they're wet blue and then they re-tanned as a, as a veg tan. Right. Uh, wax and oiled and so on. Um, yeah. And then they're, you know, they're, they're doing lining as well for us, and then a, and then our um, our veg tan insoles are made by them as well. Um, and on the like you know on oh that's on this on this boot even you know these pull tabs are made in Melbourne um, right by an old uh, a company that's been making rope and webbing for a hundred and something years, one of the last people that make jacquard you know that do jacquard um, right, right. and then. Yes. The outsoles on these are made in Adelaide, so that's the same mould that RM used to use before they started getting their soles made yeah. overseas. So they actually look like uh, Ian Harrell soles. Yeah, so whether, that's, you know. it's an old, yeah, it's just an old stipple sole. So yeah. you know, like it, it's a very traditional um, nitrile rubber um, stipple sole, and you know, like pretty pretty ubiquitous with the Australian boot. But and and, the, and these guys used to make them for most of those people, um, and yeah. they had you know. Prior to RM um, outsourcing their production um, or offshoring their production, I should say, the, you know, the, the company that make that make these had 30 staff, and yeah. now there's now they've got four. You know, yeah. So I guess, uh, and they and they were on the brink of kind of you know stopping that this kind of thing altogether. Like they, they were they were just moving into kind of shoe care products and so forth. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that um, anyway. So it's so it's great for us to be able to. You know, like they're making soles and heels and and heel stacks and stuff for us. You know, for us yeah. to be able to to work with those guys and hopefully keep their doors open because you know once they're gone, yeah. they're gone. No one, yeah. There's no that's one right. making soles in Australia anymore. Yeah, you know? that's so, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, look, you've got to open your store in a few minutes. So <laughs> oh, <that's all laughs> as right. we wind yeah. up, I just ask you the last question: like, where to from here? Where do you see yourself going? Yeah, well, it's a good question. It's a question we ask ourselves often. Um, we, I, I'm, 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 I'm keen. Like I said at the start, I think is 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 to try and step into that void between, um, you know, a single person operation and and Ira Williams who are making half a million pairs a year. Um, you know, and it, uh, so for us, it's about streamlining our processes and and um. You know, and, and finding ways of reaching as many people as we possibly can in order to to get high quality things to them directly. And yeah. I, I suppose that's the, that's the thing that is different for us as opposed to a lot of other shoe brands too. Like I was saying, with wholesale being a problem. So we, you know, the aim for the aim of the game for us is to get the products to, directly to the customer because then we yeah. cut out a whole bunch of you know doubling of yeah. margins. Uh, and so, therefore, we can make a higher quality thing and still still keep it at a you know an affordable price. So, it's a it's a it's a difficult balancing act to strike, uh, you know, being able to to do that well um, and and not compromise on the quality or the you know the provenance of the of the, the raw materials. Um, so, I guess that's a very long answer to that question. We we intend to grow to some extent, but not to the extent of you know, we're not going to be making a thousand pairs a week. That's for sure. I, you know, if we were making a thousand pairs a year, I'd be pretty impressed. Well, that 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 sounds like a Jess Wooden balancing act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I I think today's world, like boots, have grown. Uh, uh, yeah. the, I, I got onto boots during COVID when I was you know letting my fingers do the scrolling. Yeah, sure. uh, and clearly, in the last four years that I've been involved in the boot world, it it really has grown, and people are more interested. And I think people are seeing the interest in that personal approach that you're mm. talking about, that it's direct to customer. We talk to the maker, you know, yep. preferably we walk into your workshop and you look at our feet, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's, there's definitely a niche there that's that's unfulfilled around the mm. world. Oh, no, for sure. And I think, I mean, I think that's generally a, a sentiment. I mean, it's not it's not the most populous sent, sentiment. It's not going to be something, you know, we're never, we, obviously we're never going to be competing with Kmart. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, generally speaking, I think people are, are realizing that we need to do things differently. That we need to waste less stuff. We need to buy things. You know, we need to buy things that are better and that last longer yeah. and look after them and that sort of thing. And 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 we also, you know, there's an environmental thing, obviously, that that, yeah. that is driving that. Um, but also, I think that people are looking for some sort of connection yeah. and meaning in their life. And yeah. and so therefore that like like you say you know buying directly from the people that make the thing whether it be boots or furniture or you yeah. know um, farmers yeah. markets or you know yeah. produce whatever 
people are really looking to to kind of put back into their local community and and have a, some sort of meaningful connection with the people that they're supporting or buying things from. Yeah. You know, and and so I think that's like that's yeah that that's where we're fitting in for sure. Yeah. And and yeah. that I think that's what resonates with me. You know, like I, I'm not I'm not interested in being a mass a mass manufacturer or a mass market brand, but I do really want to. Uh, what what drives us is 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 to maximize the potential of the workshop that we've set up and and maximize the potential interactions we can like positive interactions we can have with people like the more people who people whose minds we can change and whose lives we can positively positively impact and that that the, the better basically yeah yeah that's terrific that's a great ending <laughs> uh, <laughs> jess thanks so much for your time i i know you you're opening the store now this morning so right. thank you very yeah. much for being able to to sit with me and go through this it's been really enjoyable thank you yeah, thanks for your thanks for your interest. I'm um, I'm always flattered when people are interested in what we're doing. So and yeah, and, and I, also I I've got to say too, I, having watched some of your YouTube stuff, I really appreciate the kind of the open uh, and honest you know approach that you take, and it's, it's great. No, thank there's you. No, it, it's not all you know flashing lights and buzzwords, which is great. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm hoping to be in uh, uh, Melbourne in uh, I think it might be in May. So I'll definitely come down to see you. Yeah, I'd love that. That'd be great. I'll show you around. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Talk to you soon.